anything if you could spend one more Father's Day with your father. And there are some of you, like my daughter-in-law, who have a special father, man of God in their life, and are not able to be with him today. So my, my heart goes out to you, and I understand the... Um, I understand that there are different times of your life that you wish that you could do things that are out of your control, and our heart goes out to you in that. But make sure, if you haven't already, to take the time and um, make sure that your father knows that you appreciate them and that you love them, and I believe that would be commendable. How many of you agree with that this morning? And I, I believe that that would be the will of God this morning, that he that he would be first and foremost, God is, and your fathers would also be representative uh, of the things that have been sown into your life. Uh, there are many different represented needs this morning in our church, different people that are in the hospital or at home sick, and uh, I wish if it was in my power to do so that I could change these things. And the only thing that I have the power to do is operate under the authority of God. And I cannot, I cannot do what God will not allow me to do, but I can surely do this. Sister Tracy taught this morning in our Sunday school class so well about prayer, and I can definitely pray. And I remember several years back, those of you that listen to music and maybe have listened to some Southern gospel, you may recall this, but I believe it was the Perry's uh, singing group, and uh, Tracy Stuffle, I think is his name, the uh, one of the lead singers there. But anyway, he had made a statement on uh, one of the albums that, you know, a lot of times we, we discount prayer. And he said, you know, uh, one, one of the times that he had mentioned in one of his live uh, services or sings that a lot of times we'll say, hey, you know, in passing, I'll pray for you. And, um, and we, we take it so lightly. And I wonder sometimes if people really actually do what they say they're going to do. Say, hey, I'll pray for you. And pray. it's so convenient, and it's just so easy to say that. But does it really have meaning to people? And that's what you wonder sometimes. And if you've ever been sick or you've ever been in a difficult place, you don't want somebody just haphazardly say, I'll pray for you. Uh, it, uh, you don't want it to be a meaningless thing. You really want somebody to take your needs and your, your problems and your, your, your dilemmas seriously and ask God to do something about it. And I challenged myself many years ago uh, on that premise. I challenged myself that when I tell somebody I'm going to pray for them, one of the best things you could ever do, if you tell somebody I'm going to pray for you, you better do it right away. And even if, it, even if you can't get down and, and Pentecostal-style prayer and really burn the heavens up, you better go ahead and pray right then. Because unfortunately, these human minds of ours can get uh, preoccupied and busy and forget about it. And so uh, that's the best way to pray. If you've got somebody on the phone and they're in desperate need and there's something going on, sometimes the best thing to do is say, so let's just pray right now. Because otherwise, you may, you, know, you may lose that opportunity or you may lose the, the train of thought about prayer. But I can tell you the greatest thing we can do is just pray for every one of these needs. We've got a lot of folks represented that are in need this morning. And as I preach to you, there are people that wish they could be here and they can't. And there are others that are in a spiritual condition that they may not want to be here, but inside of them is a precious soul. And my heart goes out to those that are wayward, those that are backslidden this morning. Because this life is way too short to, to uh, you know, uh, fool around, I guess you should say, with, and, and play a spiritual Russian roulette with your soul. It really is. But this morning, I'd like to uh, uh, pay close attention and put a little focus on the theme of our day and, and dealing with the subject of fathers. And, and uh, we just want to obey the Lord. And I'm, I'm going to try really hard. This is hard for me, folks. If I ever try to condense uh, what God has given me, like one black preacher put it, it's like trying to put 10 pounds of sugar in a five-pound bag. And it just don't work real well. But I'm going to do my best. And, and I'm going to try to obey the Lord here today. And we had a fantastic service the other night. And I preached for 86 minutes in that church down in Tampa at 88 degrees. And so I gave a lot then. So I guess if I could just kind of divide it up, I pretend like I can preach just a little bit and divide the two services. And it was two normal services. How about that? Stand to your feet this morning. Y'all looking at me funny this morning. Praise the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3. Hallelujah, thinking how you're going to do it, but we're going to try. We're going to try real hard this morning. Proverbs chapter 3, 
We're going to begin with verse number 11. We're going to read through to verse number 24. And uh, if you're visiting this morning, we want you to feel welcome, part of the Gray Street family here. And uh, if you're part of God's family, you're already part of this family. We're one in God, and that's what matters today. Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 11, and if you have it, say amen. The Bible says this, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he does what? He correcteth. Even as what? A father, the son in whom he delighteth. In other words, if a, if a father loves his son, he delights in him, he's going to correct him. The Bible said, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise is, to, is better than merchandise of silver. And the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies. And all these things are all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand. In her left hand, riches and honor. He's talking here about wisdom. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. The Lord, by wisdom, hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up, and the clouds drop the dew. Now listen. Now he's refocusing his attention. He's still talking to that, that potential son. My son... Let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul, and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in the way, or thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be Sweet. Isn't that good this morning? Stretch your hand to the Lord and let's pray and ask God to just have his way in this service. Lamb of God, we love you this morning. We're so thankful that today for the word of God, for this special service, the fathers that we have represented here today. For the next few moments, I pray, God, that you'll give me the divine anointing that will separate men from men of God. And I pray this morning that the anointing of the Holy Ghost will be powerful in this service. Convict us, draw us closer. God, challenge us. And I pray, God, that you'll give us the knowledge to be better than we've ever been, deeper than we've ever been, and closer than we've ever been. In the precious name of Jesus, And everyone can say amen this morning. I want you to know today that we, we can look at the Word of God and we understand that the Bible has no real shortage of inferences to our God or God the Father here being likened unto our earthly fathers. We have stories in the Bible about the prodigal son and other inferences in the Word of God where it talks about God our Father and He gives a likeness of our earthly father. You see, God does this beautiful thing in the Word of God to make things real to us and to help us to have the beauty of understanding. And he does that a lot of times through examples and through parables. And that is something that I have incorporated into my own personal way of handling problems and explaining the Word of God and witnessing to people. A lot of times I try to use things that are familiar to us to explain biblical principles to people because what I find is, is that sometimes we read the Bible and we, we tell people what the Bible says, but they don't clearly understand how that applies to their life. And so you may have stories in the Bible where that Jesus spoke to a generation of people that understood ships and fishing and boats and fig trees and planting and sowing and all of these things that were common to their day. And he begins to give them examples for them to understand what it is that he's trying to say. And I don't know about you, but there have been times that I've had somebody say, this is like this. And when they tell me that, it's like a light bulb goes off and say, oh, I understand what you're trying to say now. And so what God is doing is he is making it real to everyday life. 
And so when I understand the word and how that God uses earthly fathers to demonstrate his love for his people and the likeness of his oversight and, and his overseeing of his children, his people, and being likened unto that of a father, we can take that going and coming two different ways. We can see that, first of all, God's love being likened unto that of a father that we may have a good for earthly father. I know we got some that may not be a very good earthly father, but we can look at it this morning and understand the same way that my own father, he raised me up, you know, and he gave me a place to stay and he loved me and he went to work and he provided and he showed me that he cared and he showed me compassion or whatever that my earthly father could do. God says the same way that he cared about you. He brought you into this world. He took care of you. There came a time that you launched out. You became an adult and you were on your own the same way that God says, I, I created you. I brought you into this world. I gave you that platform. I raised you up. And there came a time that you got off the milk of the world and you began to walk on your own and I was there to catch you when you fell. I was there to give you advice when you need. I was there to give you wisdom when you needed wisdom. I was there when you wanted direction. And I was there when you needed me. There were times in your life that you, you wanted to do your own thing and you didn't come to dad anymore. And it's the same way with God. I understand that as I get older, I've got a grandchild that's three years old now. I've got children that are on their own. So I, I see how that we can look at this from God's perspective. How that when children get older, you have sown all of these things into their life, but ultimately it is up to them to make the grand decision of what direction that they are going to take. You can't force feed it on them. You can give them the best upbringing. You can raise them in church. You can put the silver spoon of religion in their mouth. But when they get old enough, they can either chew on it, they can either take it, receive it, act upon it, or they can cast it aside. You know, it's the same way with God. God said, I brought you into this world. In your mother's womb, I knew you. I can even know the number of hairs that are on your head or the lack thereof. Come on now. God said, I know everything there is to know about you. I was there to give you wisdom in your early life. I was there if you called upon me, but if you didn't want anything to do with me, I never forced myself on you. And this is a likeness when we look at how God is. God loves us sometimes because of our own stubbornness, because we want to do our own thing. God has to love us at a distance while we do our own thing and make our own decisions and we give God the stiff arm, so to speak, and we keep God at bay. You understand, I have counseled many fathers, talk with many fathers, and I know how this feels myself, that there are those times that while a child may be doing their own thing, they don't want any in interference. They don't want dad to intervene in any way. They don't want to hear what dad has to say about it. And so they begin to make decisions on their own. And sometimes dad has to sit back and he has to watch while they make critical decisions that may mar their testimony or mess the rest of their life up and your hands are tied. You can't do anything. You understand that it's similar to that. When we think about God this morning, God stands back and God says, I'm not going to force myself on you. I love you. I am your, I'm your heavenly father. But I've watched you. I've watched you make a lot of decisions uh, that I'd love to step in. But I love you enough uh, that I'm not going to force myself on you. If you want me, I will come to you. That is the reason why that when a son or a daughter gets in the desperate need of trouble, that they may pick up the telephone and say, Dad, I'm in a bad way. I want you to know that when my daughter was running from the Lord and backslid on God, I can tell you, I don't know where she felt she stood with God. I'm just being plain, but I will tell you this, as much as I love my daughter, I still remember the day that she walked up on my driveway and looked at me in tears flowing down her face. I was in the middle of working on my truck, doing some things, and she said, Dad, I need you. I said, why do you need me? She said, there are, there's demons in my house. I need you to come and pray over my house. You know, I hadn't heard from her in a while. I try to tell her, I try to call her, I try to tell her I love her, and it was almost as if I really don't want you there. There were times I would say I love you, and I may give her a Bible verse. She wouldn't
wouldn't reply. There were times I'd say, I, I just want you to know I'm thinking about you. And I would give her a little Bible verse. You know, the Lord loves you too. One day, she hurt my feelings. Uh, she told me, she said, Dad, I just want a dad. I don't want a preacher. I don't want, I don't want to be preached to. I don't want to hear about all of that. Do you know, I said, honey, I said, I know you may not want a preacher. I said, but I wouldn't be a real father if I didn't also concern myself with your spiritual condition. What kind of father just says, hey, I'm just checking on you, but is not concerned about your eternal soul. I said, it's hard for me to do that. You know, for days, I, I kind of moped around trying to think how in the world I can never make an impact on her life. But you know what I chose to do? The same thing that my heavenly father does. I'm not gonna force myself on you, but when you get ready and you decide you want daddy, I'll be right here. I'm gonna show you compassion. I'm gonna show you mercy. I'm not gonna throw you under the bridge. I'm not gonna cast you out. There were times that I watch and I see you may spend your money on crazy stuff and you got nothing to show for it. and then you get yourself in a bind and you look to dad and you say, dad, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Well, I might just come along and do the same thing the heavenly father would do and say, baby, I want you to understand there's a reason why you don't have any money. There were things that you do, you shouldn't have bought. That's just being a dad. If you don't like that and you just want dad's money, then you might want to go to Amscot and ask them for some money because daddy's going to tell you how it is. I'm going to tell you in a loving way. You shouldn't have spent. You shouldn't have done. That's how you got in this condition. But lo and behold, at the end of the story and when the conversation's over with, I'm not going to send my daughter and I'm not going to send my son down the road without any food in the cupboard or any groceries or any diapers for that grandbaby or milk for her little sippy cup. Say amen. I'm going to make sure that as a dad that I'm going to play the role of a father and I'm going to play it well. You know the reason why is because my heavenly father when I came like a prodigal son to the foot of the cross and my life been messed up and I kept him at bay for years that in 1997 I said heavenly father here I am. He didn't cast me out. He said I didn't come for the for those that think they're whole. I didn't come for those that think they got it all together. He said I came for the sick and sister Wilma I showed up at God's spiritual doorstep sick, broken, messed up. My life was a mess and when I showed up I said here I am. I need mercy. You know that's the same thing that a real father does. When that child comes they may come on somebody. They may have spike green hair tattoos from head to toe. They may look like the world has had its way with them but I can tell you this. I don't care what they look like. How they come. Daddy still loves you. I may not agree with everything you did but I'm a father like a heavenly father and I'm going to show you love and mercy somebody raise your hand and just thank him right now <laughs> Woo! raise your hand and praise him somebody we need no hurry raise your hand and love him this morning hallelujah but these similarities are all through the word of God and I want you to know this morning a father cannot expect a child to become what he has not demonstrated before them you cannot expect your son to have respect for his wife and treat her with love and compassion and kindness and like a woman deserves to be treated unless you too have done that I told you people are got children are going to pave their own path but I want to live in such a way and I feel like I have for the most part I don't know any parent that don't have some regrets but I want to be able to look back and I feel like I can and say I tried to be the best daddy I could I tried to love on your mama you didn't ever see me beat on her slap on her abuse her and hurt her and you don't do the same for your daughter, your wife you see I believe you can't expect from your children what you won't do yourself dad say amen somebody I'm telling you this morning and the same goes that a child cannot expect a father to pour into them what they will not allow him to pour into them. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I have had times 
Boy, I'm, when it comes to talking, my kids said it was the Andy Griffith talk. The sit on the corner of the bed and talk for 45 minutes to an hour talk. Sometimes my daughter, she's a lot like me in some ways, uh, the way she does things and handles some things. And sometimes it makes it hard because we're both hard headed about some things. And there were times she'll be sitting on the corner of the bed and me trying to talk to her and she's already planning her attack. Come on, somebody. I can see it in her eyes. I, I, look, I, there have been times, Sister Benefield, I stopped in the middle of conversation. I said, you ain't even listening to me. I said, all you're doing is planning your rebuttal. Come on now. You're just planning what you're going to say. That's all you come on. And, and my daughter just looked at me, and sometimes she would laugh uh, because she knew I was right. Uh, other times she would get mad. Uh, I, but either way, Daddy told it like it was. I said, you just, you ain't even listening to me. Uh, but there have been times... Uh, I try to tell them something and I said I know you might be a teenager and I know you know everything and I know you know more than me I understand that I get that I've all, I was there I remember that I said but you will soon forget find out that there are going to be things you're going to get yourself into I said put on your big girl britches because it's about to get rough you think it's bad honey you don't know what it's like when you got babies and they need to be fed and you got to go to work sick in your body and you're about to lose your job because you already lost a few days of work. Come on, somebody, you get up and you're so tired you can't even hardly get yourself out of bed. But like I told him in revival the other night, just like Shammah, when Shammah defended that patch of lentils for the whole Philistine because the Philistines were coming to destroy that whole patch of peas and that people, the people ran off and fled. But he stood in a patch of peas and defended what they wouldn't even fight for. I said, I had... Uh, my cousin and her husband I said you stand in front of her I said sometimes uh, I had my cousin stand behind her husband I said sometimes when you stand right smack in the middle of that patch of peas uh, sometimes when it gets hard and the battle gets tough you got to turn around and look at the reason why you're fighting for this thing that's the reason why grandparents get so frustrated sometimes as you get looking and you you thinking to yourself, you got a grandbaby, you got children that are worth fighting for. Think outside the box beside somebody beside yourself. That's what parents think. That's a grandparent's thought process as well. There's a reason. I don't say that to condemn anybody because the fact is some parents that feel that way were once just like that with their parents. But I'm glad this morning that I can look to God and as long as I will open up the top of my reservoir, my Father in heaven will keep pouring. But the day that I say, I got enough, I got it all, I have arrived, I know everything, then God's not going to pour what I won't let him pour. And it is the same way with your fathers. Daddy might sit on the corner of the bed and he might say, baby, if you stay on this path, you're going to end in destruction. If you close your ears off, you're going to find out before too long that most likely daddy was right. I sat right there in my very living room. And I, I'm going to be personal with you. When my daughter and my son-in-law talked about getting married, I told you I use a lot of examples. And if I can remember and tell this just right, I didn't plan on sharing this, but I'm going to anyway. I told my son-in-law, I said, son, when I was in high school, our home economics teacher shared with us that if we start right now, that every time we get a paycheck, if we didn't have a job when you got a job, that every week that you put back, I think it was $7, by the time you are old enough to retire, you will have more than enough money to retire on. So, I began to think about that premise. Because by the time you build up that money, it takes a long time. You might actually have something. My wife's grandparents, great-grandparents, if I'm not mistaken, they were the type of people, they live up in Kentucky, and every time they got paychecks, 
If I'm not mistaken, that a certain amount of money taken out of their paycheck, ten, fifteen dollars. If they got a big check, twenty five dollars. And they say that whenever her her grandparents passed away, they had money hidden in cans and money all over the house. Praise God. No, I didn't ask where they lived. I'd never been there. I wasn't worried. I didn't, I, come on now. But what I found out is that they took the same principle and they applied it to their life. And as I sit there and I look at my daughter and my son-in-law, I said, son, I said, taking that into account is what I'm about to say. I said, suppose, I said that you, every week, I said, you put a little money from your paycheck, your hard-earned money, and I said, you take $10 this week. Next week, it might be 25 The week after, maybe you didn't have much of a check and you worked yourself to death, but you put $5 back. You remember every Every single sacrifice that you made along the year's way. I said every time that you barely made it to work. All the times that you fought all of hell just to be able to make a dollar. I said, but you put that money back. I said, and then suppose after you had you had raised money for over 18 years. I said, and then you look at all the money. And I said, let's just say for the sake of example. I said that there was over $50,000 in money that you had saved up over the course of 18 years. I said, you took all that sacrifice. I said, when you look at that $50,000, you remember all the sacrifices and that money means everything to you because you have took all your sweat, blood and tears to make it what it is today. And I said, then you have somebody come along and says, let me take that money and let me continue to invest in it. I said, would you want to just give anybody that $50,000? Because you've spent 18 years building it up to what it is. I said, son, what I'm telling you is, I said, I have spent 18 years of this girl's life investing, taking her to youth camps. I said, taking her to church, praying with her around the altars. I was there the night at six years old when she rolled across the floor of the house church, chairs laying everywhere, laying in the corner of the room by herself, speaking in tongues, baptized in the Holy Ghost. I said, you want her hand in marriage? I said, let me tell you. I said, if you don't plan on taking the investments that I made and continue to invest in what I invested in and capitalize on it and multiply I said then don't take her hand and he said oh I'm going to let me tell you this morning the reason that I told him that is because a father spends a lot of time pouring into a child when I went to South Carolina or Tennessee and I got to preaching up there in a revival before I went to another revival I saw this young lady up there singing with her family and the first thought came to my mind is look at that young girl up there what a precious young child of God and I began to watch her and I thought to myself boy she'd make a, a wonderful woman of God for somebody one day and the more that that thought rang through my mind the spirit of God kept checking me and y'all gonna think I'm crazy but whenever she, when I got back home to Florida I got to talking to my son I said son there's this young girl that we ran into him in South Carolina I said boy she is very sweet She's a pretty girl. And I said, she loves God. I said, you ought to talk to her. I said, maybe y'all might hit it off. I contacted her through Facebook. And the next thing you know, before we know it, they're married. Hey, Amen. Let me tell you, folks, the reason is, is when I looked at her life, I told my son, I said, boy, if you mess this up, you messed up. I said, she's a good girl. I said, but here's the thing. Just like I tried and tried with my own daughter. Hey, Amen. Her dad daddy and her mama made little investments and little deposits along the way. They sowed and they sowed to make her who she is today. Ultimately, baby girl, it's your choice what you do. But at the end of this day, you ought to make a phone call and say, mama and daddy, thank God you made me who I am today. There's some parents, grandparents, there's some men and women of God here this morning that could look at me and say, I had a good mama. I had a good daddy. I had a praying and a praying mom and daddy. There are some of you that cannot say that. I'm not going to go into my own past, but I will tell you this much. I'm going to tell you the same thing that my pastor's wife told me when I hadn't long been saved. I began to tell them one day 
I was very distraught because I looked around the church and I would hear all these magnificent testimonies of people that were raised, just basically hand-fed the gospel, raised in church all of their lives. Some of them that were serving God and what have you. And I looked at my own life. I hardly ever went to church. There was a couple times mama got a case of the do-betters and we went to church and we went there for a little while and then it was over with. But I wasn't raised in the house of God. And I didn't know the ways of God. I didn't know the Bible. I knew little stories like Noah's Ark, but I didn't even know that very well. And when I went before my pastor and pastor's wife, I told my pastor's wife, I said, I was up very upset. I said, I don't have the testimony other people have. I said, I cannot say that my mama serves God. I cannot say that my dad was a man of God. I cannot say that my mama taught Sunday school or that my daddy was a prayer boy. I cannot say any of those things. You know what my mama, what my pastor's wife told me? She leaned across the table. She grabbed me by the hand. She said, Brother Joe, she said, listen to me. She said, you start a new trend. You start a new trend. Tears flowing down my face. I thought about it. I said, that's just what I'm going to do. And so, youth camps, camp meetings, church service, revival, prayer, devotions. I'm telling you, we gave it, we gave, and we gave. You know why? Because when I look back, I have this thought in my mind, Sister Jackson, I don't know what they'll do with this platform that I gave them. But I want to be able, if I lay on my dying bed, I don't want to live with any regrets. Because one thing I can tell you as a pastor, I have had plenty of people that I have pastor that decided way late in the game to give their life to God. And they didn't raise their children in church. And they looked at me with tears flowing down their face and said, now they won't listen to me because all of my life I've lived like this. And they followed that example and now when I try to tell them about the Lord, uh, they throw my past in my face. Uh, and I tell you folks, uh, you ain't got to live with regrets. Uh, you hear what I'm saying, somebody? You don't have to go down that road. Uh, you can be an upstanding and an upright man, a daddy, a mama, a grandma, or a grandpa. And some of you might say, Pastor Myers, I've made a lot of decisions and I've made a lot of bad ones uh, and I cannot change that. Well, here's my best advice. Do the same thing my pastor's wife said. Start a new trend, honey. You might have missed your whole adulthood life. Here you are, and you're a grandma or a great grandma right here, right now. Well, amen. Step out of yesterday's door. Step into today's and be the best saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost baptized granny and grandpapa that you ever could be. That's what you do, folks. You set an example. That's what you don't understand. You only get one chance to do it right. If there's ever been a true statement, hang on to that one. You don't get but one chance. So oh, there's a lot of chances in 18 years. I understand what you're saying, but you only get one you only get one set of 18 years if that makes any sense you only get one chance to get it right by the time they're grown you can't go back to the 3s or the 6s or the day when they were 10 that's gone that's over with if i could advise you of anything live with no regrets i got so much more to preach but i'm going to try to Wrap this up because I told you I can't preach long this morning. I got my heart as full. I could preach another hour if the Lord had let me. But I'm going to tell you this. There are two things that I need to share with you before I close. Number one, a father has a responsibility. It's a great responsibility to be a man of God that will sow integrity into his children. A man that is a man of his word. And if you will live that before your children, there's a greater chance that they will do that. I have seen children that were raised in Christian homes be backslid 
and some of the great attributes that mom and daddy sowed into them growing up, they still even backslid, still practice some of the, the, the monumental things that the, the standards of integrity, compassion, and wisdom, and the things that dad sowed into them. My dad, my stepfather, he might not have been saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. But Brother Farmer, I took from that man what I could. I watched his life. That man would get up sick. It didn't matter if he had an hour of sleep. Get up the next day, go to work, and take care of his family. And when I was old enough, at 14 years old, I had a full-time job, and I had a full-time job since then. And I graduated from high school with a full-time job. I said the reason was, was because I give my dad the credit for the fact that he was a working man, and he sold a work ethic in me. Some of you may say, that's nothing to do with church that's nothing to do with the bible hogwash i believe that i'm lazy man the bible said if you don't work you don't eat amen i want to tell you something folks uh, we got enough lazy people wanting to live off the government and everything else i can tell you this much uh, if you ain't got it thank god we got a welfare system thank god for the government because i have had to take advantage of it in my early part of adult life uh, and i'm thankful for it to this day but there ain't no reason for you to sit around lazy and won't take care of your children, won't take care of your wife, and your grass is waste time, you won't get out there and mow it, and you leave it to your wife or somebody else to get out there and do it, that's foolishness, amen, whatever happened to a day when men were men, come on now, amen, we were a man's man, you didn't, come on somebody, you treated your wife like a precious flower that God gave right from heaven, she's not a doormat to walk you over, she ain't a doormat to dust your feet off, you treat her with the utmost respect you talk to her like she's the greatest thing that God precious thing God ever gave you I'm telling you this morning that is what God expects but when a father sows integrity and a work ethic in his children there's a greater chance when that child gets older he has no problem with getting a shovel and digging a hole if he has to. He's not too good to get his hands dirty. You show me a prissy man with too afraid to get his fingernail broke or dirty, you'll show me somebody I got to pray for, folks. I mean for seriousness. I can't hardly take that stuff for the life of me. Amen. I don't believe in no feminine men. I believe in being a man's man. If you're a woman, I believe in being a woman. Say amen. But I got to get off that. What I'm telling you is, uh, is that a father has got to so he's got to sow into his son to be a man, boy. Huh? I'll get myself in trouble, so I got to move on. But you got to sow into that boy the right work ethic, that girl the right work ethic. I can tell you, my wife can tell you the same thing. I've had along the way, my kids, when they was wanting to play and play video games and everything, they'll be underneath a truck with me, cutting an exhaust off, fixing this, underneath the car, changing oil. I told my son at about 15, 16 years old, him wanting to sit around the house and do nothing, I said, get your clothes on. What are we doing? I said, we're going to go change the oil in the car. What? I said, yeah, come on. Well, he's looking like, oh, that might be all right. We get out there. I gave him a wrench. I said, this is called a wrench. I said, that, you got to take that off. I said, the oil's going to get all over your hand. I said, if it splashes on you, don't mind it. I said, it's just called work. So I taught him how to change oil. I said, because one of these days, you're going to need to know how to change your own oil. Hey, and daddy ain't going to have time to come and change your oil and my oil and everybody else's oil. I got on to him the other day. I said, when's the last time you changed the oil in this thing? I said, I'm the last one change it. I know, Dad. But don't let him fool you. He knows how to do it. What I'm telling you is, you got to sow into your children. My wife... Before my daughter was old enough, I mean old enough to just about stand up on a chair in the kitchen. She was teaching her how to cook, how to be a wife, how to, how to take care of a family. We was teaching her how to write checks and everything. Thank God. Amen. Because daddy ain't always going to be there to write a check for you. Say amen. What you are doing is you are making little investments, little deposits into their life, dad. And if you're not willing to make those deposits, somebody will. 
And it might be one of their buddies at school or it might be some other person or some other group or some other thing that shows the wrong things into their life because kids are hungry and they're searching for something. Can you say amen? I got to preach on here this morning. You just pray God to help me because I got, I got so much to preach but I'm almost done here for real. For the father of these two responsibilities, the father's responsibility is integrity, commitment, a work ethic and an eternal purpose. This is the most important of all. If you can teach your son how to throw a, a, a baseball or teach him how to play football and he may become a, 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 some kind of professional athlete and that would be all fine and well if he makes a good living in it, praise God. But I can tell you this, the greatest thing you could teach your son is how to be a man of God, bar none. And that is, the reason is because you're, you are sowing into your children an eternal purpose. Is there anybody besides me that's ever been in a place where either you felt like or you were literally on the verge of death. Anybody besides me ever faced the idea that I could die any minute here? I have said this so many times over the years, especially when there's a funeral. Nothing brings life into perspective like death. That's the reason why people start rethinking life whenever there's a funeral of a loved one. Then they get thinking about how short life is because the Bible said life is but a vapor. It appears for a little while, then it is gone. It's just like a puff of smoke. You saw it, and then the next thing you know, it's gone. That's why people say they were just here yesterday. And here's what I'm showing you. You have got to be able to sow into your children, your grandchildren, and an eternal purpose. Because the truth is, whether they're three years old and they're taken into the water by some freak accident by an alligator or they're standing in a crowd of people at 16 or 17 years old thinking that they're hanging out with the other kids in the club and they're a part of a mass shooting and they die. That child, if you have not sown into their life and their understanding of an eternal purpose, the eternal purpose is this, Brother Steve. It's the fact that everything in life is not about the here and now. It's not all about the money that you can make today and the deposit you can make in your bank next week because the folks that have been nearest to death can tell you that they look back and they understand the reality of what's important and what's not important. I've got to hurry. I want to share one last story and then I've got to close here in just a minute. My uncle, when my uncle was near death, he had something wrong with his heart. He was at work. He was driving a dump truck. He had some issues. His heart stopped working and whatnot. He kept thinking maybe he just got overheated so he tried to eat a little bit of a sandwich. He ended up passing out on the side out in the middle of nowhere where he was dumping a load of dirt or sand and he had to actually when he came to crawl back to the, 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 the dump truck get back in it and he drove back to work and he kept refusing to believe something was wrong with him until the people at work when he got back said no there's something serious wrong they called an ambulance they got him there he said the whole time he was telling me this story he said I kept thinking this is so ridiculous I just want to go back to work that's how a lot of men are Stubborn. I just want to go back to work. I don't need to be here. I don't need all these machines. I don't want to be hooked up to this stuff. This is so stupid. That's the way they look at it. That's exactly what I've heard him say. And that's what he said. And he said, but as time went on, I could see the looks on their faces and I could see the concern. And he said, what really got my attention is whenever they hollered out whatever code that it is, that emergency, whatever it's code red or blue or whatever it is, and he said, we got to take him to emergency surgery right now. He said, at that very split second, he said, all day, all I could think about, I had a motorcycle payment that was due. I had several loads of dirt that I had to pick up and get delivered. I had several things and projects going on. He was always fixing up old cars, hot rods, we called them. All that was on his mind, but he said at that split second, he said, I forgot about the motorcycle payment. I forgot about the house payment. I forgot about the problems at home, the cars and the parts that I needed to get to get this vehicle going. He said, all of that didn't mean anything to me. He said, the only thing that mattered right there at that very moment was life. And I want you to know something, folks, unfortunately for some people, because nobody taught them eternal purpose there will come a day, possibly, where they look and they understand my life could be about to be over. What is next? I have made no preparations for the hereafter. 
your heart may not even be right with God. And that's the scariest thing of all. Can you say amen, somebody? The last thing is that not only is there responsibility on a father, but a child has a responsibility. I told you earlier that a father cannot pour into you what you won't let him if you keep him at bay. And that goes for God, our father, as well. But there's one other thing, too. In light of that, fathers are put in our life, and I believe in a lot of ways, to provide the correction that we need to get us on track. I read in the book of Revelations where that God was talking about the church, and he said, Be zealous, therefore, and repent, because them that I love, I chasten. Not very many people like chastening. We don't like to be corrected. But the truth is, a child must be willing to accept and receive correction. There are going to be times as you're an adult, and God, your father, tries to correct you. It's your responsibility as a child to yield to that correction when God deals with you. But there's one other thing, and this applies to the earthly father probably more than anything here because God is perfect in all ways. But the last thing was a child's responsibility to their fathers is discernment. I think a father needs to sow into his child to understand discernment because of this. You need to discern right from wrong because as much as I'd like to think that every single thing I've ever done as a father was perfect, I can't say that. And a child has a responsibility to decipher what's right, what's not right. Pastor Myers, that's kind of a lot to put on a child. Well, maybe on a really young child, but you need to teach your child that because a child needs to understand that daddy may have a bad day at work, come home, and he may fly off the handle. And you can't look at daddy and say, that's the way I should do, because daddy gets upset like that, so I should do that. As you get older as a child, the reason I say this is I have counsel with a lot of people in my time of witnessing and talking with people. And I have seen people try to justify their unrighteous ways because they will say things like, I'm just like my dad was. He tells it like it is. I'm just like my mama is. I do. I, you, you better not mess. Don't cross me. You know. Don't use what your daddy or mama did if they were in the wrong to justify you continually being wrong. You have a responsibility as a recipient, as a child, whether it be you know, spiritually or in, in the natural. You have a responsibility to look at God's word and, and say, if God's word says this is wrong, if my daddy sets this example, but God's word says that that's not right, guess what I'm supposed to do? I have a responsibility to follow the word of God and not daddy. You understand? Paul made this statement. You, I've heard people say, we shall not follow men. I understand what people mean when they say that. But Paul said, follow me as I follow God. What Paul was saying was not that I want you to look at me like I'm Jesus. But Paul was trying to explain to the people, if I live a righteous lifestyle, follow the, that, that example. And you see, fathers, Paul was like a father of the church in a way. He, he, he was one that had pioneered and, and planted a lot of churches. So a lot of people really like with Brother Hanks when he goes over to mission fields. People look at him like, he was like he's like a church father in a way. And I want you to know that the Apostle Paul in a lot of ways was reverenced and respected by the true, genuine church. And they looked at him and Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And I'm telling you, as a father, you have a responsibility to set that example. But as a child, you have the responsibility to follow the right path. I prayed right here in this altar for a child. I prayed right here at one point for a child. And I said to them, you and I both know the past of your own parents. I said, is that the path that you want to live out yourself? And that child cried almost uncontrollably. You know why? Because mom and daddy was living a very unrighteous lifestyle and that child knew Enough in their heart what was right and wrong. And as a pastor, 
I wanted to take the ability not to condemn mom and daddy. I didn't say anything negative about them. I just said, what path do you want to take? If you have a mom and daddy that spent most of their life in and out of jail, on drugs, and all of these things like this child's parents have, you have to address that and say, son, daughter, use discernment. If that's the path you want to follow, then keep following mom and daddy if they're doing the wrong thing. But I would to God, Brother Benefield, that we could have some men and women of God in this generation that will sow the right things into their children. Folks, I honestly believe that a great majority of the people that are in prisons today would not be there had there been a a daddy and a mama sowing the right things. I read one statistic that talked about how that uh, I think it's 75 or 89, 90% of the, the people that were in prison either did not have a father present growing up or that the father was in and out of the home growing up. That's a pretty staggering statistic. Will you stand to your feet this morning as we get ready to dismiss this part of our service? I want to give you an opportunity this morning to pray and ask God to either help you to be the child that you should be or the father or the grandfather, grandmother, grandparent that you should be. This is your your job, your role. It's not just your parents' responsibility, but it's also yours. You might be here this morning and say, I watched my parents go through an awful divorce. If you don't want to go down that path, there may be a lot of good things that mom and daddy sown into you, but the bad things that you know that were not in line with God's word, those things, you redirect yourself and you make the right choices. And you can be the man and woman of God that God will help you to be. Sister Tracy is going to come to the piano for me this morning. And as heads are bowed and eyes are closed all across this church, I want to give you an opportunity to reach up and allow heaven to come down and kiss your soul this morning. To speak to you. That God would say to you what you need to hear to know. Just like an earthly father who's a real man, real man of God. Maybe you've gone astray or maybe there's some things you've allowed to let go in your life this morning and you're not where you need to be. Maybe you just need to sum things up and you need to reconfirm with God this morning. God, I want to make sure that I've made my my wrongs right. If that's you this morning, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to give you this opportunity right here this morning to lay all of these things before God. He said in the book of Isaiah, I believe it is, he said, though your sins be as scarlet, He said, I'll make them white as snow. And if you're here this morning and you've allowed certain decisions to stain your soul, to put wrinkles or blemishes on your earthly or your your spiritual soul, I want to tell you this morning, God is able to wash them white as snow. If that's you this morning, you say, I want to be saved. I want to give my life to the Lord. I'm not going to embarrass you. I promise you that with all of my heart. If you're here this morning, you say, I want to be saved, Pastor Myers. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking around, you just slip your hand up right now and say, I want to be saved, Brother Myers. No one's looking around. You say, I want to give my life to the Lord today. I want to know that my name's written down the Lamb's Book of Life this morning, Lord. If that's you, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to know that I've made things right with God. For those of you here this morning, you've been maybe serving the Lord for many years. And maybe you haven't been the best grandmother, the best grandfather, the father that you should have been or set the greatest example. I challenge you right here this morning to pick up this mantle and be your very best. Because they are watching everything you do this morning. Now together, those of you that don't feel compelled, if you feel compelled to come and pray, I want you to come and pray. But if you don't feel compelled right now, I want you to join with me in corporate prayer. Everyone that will raise their hands this morning with me. And let's all pray together. If you have things in your own life or maybe you have a son or daughter, maybe you have a, a niece or a nephew or someone that needs prayer right now, I want you to stretch your hand up to the Lord. And I want you to pray for those that you know this morning are struggling. You see, God has given us people in our life. And you may not be someone's biological father, but you may be the closest thing 
to a father that they'll ever have. Will you stretch your hand to the Lord right now? Lamb of God, we love you this morning. We're so, we're so thankful for the ability to approach the throne of grace, God, and call upon the name of our God. We're asking you, Lord, to help us to be the upright, the men and women of God that you have called us to be. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to shun the wrong, put on the right. I pray, God, that in all of our ways that we're sowing and we're making those investments and those deposits into our, into our people, our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren. God, help us to be the living example of what a woman of God, a man of God is.